Joining us now for Global Business Updates is Rotus Odiri. Good morning, Rotus. Good morning, Dr. Abati. Ayo, welcome back. Good morning Thank to you. you. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning to Good morning. all our viewers uh, out there. Uh, we begin with uh, oil. Big fall uh, in oil prices uh, this uh, morning. You can see Brent crude now down to 71.86, uh, almost a 2.2% drop there. Uh, West Texas Intermediate at 68.15. So that's now dropped well below the $70 uh, level. What's going on? Uh, there are reports that Saudi Arabia is going to abandon its unofficial selling price of about $100 a barrel for its particular grade of uh, uh, of uh, oil in order to expand its production. So Saudi Arabia is feeling the pinch of falling oil prices. So it's like, hey, listen, what happens when, you know, your prices of the th item you are selling, which is out of Saudi Arabia's control. So they're like, okay, listen, our own particular grade, we're going to bring that uh, price down because we want to expand production. I and mean, if you're expanding production, well, it means that you're going to be putting more barrels on the market. Also, we're getting an update from Libya that there seems to be, you know, a resolution with the issue around the central bank, uh, the leader of the central bank. And remember, we talked about this extensively a couple weeks ago. There's the f fighting in the forces in the east and the west uh, with what's been going on with who runs the central bank because whoever runs the central bank essentially gets controls the oil proceeds so libya output which is somewhere around 1.8 uh, 1.6, 1.8 has fallen down to about you know 400,000 barrels or so. So the prospect of a resolution coming on means that Libyan oil will be back uh, on the market. So that also is you know pushing uh, prices uh, downward. So again, it, it, once again, the fundamentals of demand and supply have trumped all the geopolitical news that we've heard from. Even with you know Adifemi was already giving you the lay of the land with uh, the possible ground invasion of uh, Lebanon from the Israelis. Uh, moving to Asian stocks. Asian stocks, the rally continues, particularly uh, for Chinese equities, uh, based, of course, on the um, stimulus measures. And by the way, these stimulus measures from the Chinese uh, authorities. So it's supposed to be a positive for oil because that means that if you're stimulating demand in the largest consumer of oil, which is China, second largest economy in the world, that's supposed to boost oil prices. But even this news was not able to, to, uh, to support oil. So uh, if you look at the Chinese uh, Shanghai Composite Index, that is, I mean, well over 3%. This is like the best performance we've seen from Chinese equities, I think in about four to six years. 3.3%. Um, the Nikkei in Japan up as well. The Kospi was up. The Hang Seng was up. So China, again, you can see how fast. Every day now since we've reported China's announcement of stimulus, they've done something. Two days ago, we announced the stimulus. Yesterday, they cut their reserve, um, the repo rates uh, on their medium-term uh, medium lending uh, facility for about th for 30 basis points. Remember, it was the biggest cut we've seen since 2016. Now, today, there's news that China is actually considering a massive stimulus um, for its state banks. This is to the tune of about, I mean, well over a trillion yuan, which comes out to about $142 uh, billion. Um, first time since 2008 that we've seen a massive stimulus like this. Remember, 2008 was the, the, the financial, the global financial crisis. The funding is supposed to come from some special um, sovereign bond. The details, though, not yet finalized. Um, they could be changed. But just that news coming out um, shows the rapid pace that means China is moving to try to boost um, its economy. Will they get to that 5% target? I mean, we'll find out in the, uh, in the first quarter of uh, next year. But Chinese equities are doing pretty well. Uh, we move to technology. I mean, Meta announced this artificial intelligence. Um, augmented reality glasses, but there was just so much detail. I said, okay, we'll deal with that another day. Sam Altman is what we'll focus on for uh, tech. Um, OpenAI is apparently considering giving Sam Altman a 7% stake uh, in the company. Now, look, this uh, has all been around... Um, you know, the inability of Sam Open and Open Air to avoid being, profit, being a for profit company. Remember when they were first established, it was supposed to be a non profit company, non profit entity, or oh, we want to change the world with artificial intelligence. But they quickly found out that this stuff is expensive. Um, and you have to pay about, what, $20, $25 a month to, to use ChatGPT. They've got, you know, you know, GPUs and a lot of expansion they need to do. So, you know, I think it was 2019 or so, they set up that for profit subsidiary under the non profit structure. 
But then that led to some issues, which was why Altman was kicked out of the company. Then he came back. So now it looks like the company is finally realizing that, look, we, are, we, have, to, we have to shift towards a more for-profit structure. So if you think about the valuations of the company, they are looking for more funding that would value them at $100 billion. So you give Altman a 7% a stake in that. He's going to be a pretty wealthy man. But by the way, let's go back to May of, 20, of this year, where he was on the All In podcast. Listen to what he was saying about taking an equity stake uh, in the company i wish i had taken equity so i never had to answer this question <laughs> if i could but go back in give, time why don't they give you a grand now yeah, why, why doesn't don't the they... board just give you a big option grant like you deserve yeah give you five points what was the decision back then like why was that so important uh, the decision back then the, re the original reason was just like the structure of our nonprofit. it was uh like there was something about yeah okay this is like nice from a motivations perspective but mostly it was that our board needed to be a majority of disinterested directors. And I was like, that's fine. I don't need equity right now. I kind of, mm. but like, but in I, this yeah, weird I way, wish... now that you're running a company, yeah, it, it creates these weird questions of like, well, what's your real motivation for versus it to, to, uh, yeah. that's that it, it is so deeply on I, I, one thing I have noticed it is, it is so deeply unimaginable to people to say, yeah. I don't really need more money. Like and I well, get no, people how think, I think I think people think it's a little bit of an ulterior motive. I think yeah, well, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's so right. it, it assumes you it's assume like, that. What else it's is like, he doing on the side to make money? Yeah. Something if I were if on. I were just trying to say like I'm going to try to make a trillion dollars with OpenAI, I think everybody would have an easier time, and it totally. would save me. Well, it would I save mean, a lot of conspiracy theories. Yeah, my, my favorite quote there is where I said, it is so deeply unimaginable that I would not want to make more money. That is the essence of business, is about making money, and open AI is starting to find out now. So it looks like they're, they're going to change to a for-profit structure. Speaking of money, and speaking of the United Nations General Assembly, and uh, President Tinubu, represented by Vice President Shatim, are talking about a restructuring of debt and for debt forgiveness. Let's talk about Kenya. And we're now seeing the fallout of the protests that pulled that finance bill that needed to give Kenya $2.7 billion. Kenya is now looking for money for apparently from the United Arab Emirates. Um, the reports that we're hearing is that they're looking for $1.5 billion uh, to, be to get, get from uh, Abu Dhabi. If we go further into um, the details of this uh, loan, it is to you know, bridge their financing gap. I mean, they've got a big uh, hole uh, in, their, in their budget. Now, the interest rate is reportedly about 8.2%. If you compare that to their uh, 2031 bond, uh, the coupon at the time, February, was 9.75. It's come down a bit to about 9.73. Be that as it may, the interest rate is cheaper than what the, um, the Euro, this, their last euro bond uh, is doing. Now, if we, if we go further, uh, and hopefully you have the information in front of you, look at Kenya's troubling finances. It's, the, the things are really, really bad. Um, you know, they've lost that 2.7 billion now for that we're supposed to get from that finance bill with their proposed tax increases. Their budget deficit has now gone from an estimate of 3.3% of GDP now to 4.3%. Uh, they now need, get this, $2.6 billion annually for their external debt, of which $1.5 billion is just interest alone. Um, IMF has classified their debt as distressed. They've been downgraded by all the ratings um, agencies uh, and you know Kenya is really in, in, in dire straits right now. We should have a chart, uh, if you take a look at this chart which uh, we, we decided to recreate this comes from Kenya's um, Presidential Economic Advisory Council I think his name is David Indy, he's the, he's the chair of that council and he provided some data on what Kenya's external debt looks like going into 10 years into the future to 2034. So the, the longer bar at the top is your bilateral, multilateral, and commercial debt. And then the smaller bar at the bottom, uh, in blue, I believe, is, is your euro bonds. So you just have to add each bar. So if you take 2025, you've got $2 billion in your multilateral, bilateral debt, plus $300 million in your euro bonds. That's $2.3 billion for 2025. You go to 2026, you've got $2.8 billion in uh, multilateral, bilateral debt plus 300 million that's you know what 3.3 or so that is you know you have, you've got that so just add it all the way through um to 2034 so kenya has to finance this uh debt one way uh or the other so again 
you know, it's all well and good to, you know, to say that, you know, governments should slash spending and live, stop living your lavish lifestyles and this and that, that and this. They listened to the people. They withdrew the finance bill. But now they've got to find the money elsewhere. If they cannot find this money, there will be ripple effects on infrastructure. There will be ripple effects on welfare programs. Um, Kenya also is doing fuel subsidies. There will be ripple effects there as well. It's, and, and they're looking for another, I think, 600 million or so to come from the IMF. That IMF is yet to disburse that money. Finally, um, I believe Adifemi touched on this. Uh, I think it was one of the papers. But we've confirmed that, indeed, here in Nigeria, independent oil marketers are working with uh, trying to get it uh, to buy PMS uh, from the Dangote refinery. We spoke with uh, a source at Ipman that actually confirmed it to us this morning uh, that their work, Ipman at the national level is working on it. So again, it comes down to how much is a liter of petrol uh, produced at the Dangote refinery. Maybe with more marketers, if they, this deal works and they end up having to get them to buy it from the refinery as opposed to just having NMPC as the sole uh, purchaser, we might find that out, but you know, it depends on how much they will then end up selling it to end users. So a lot going on. That's our update for today. Tell the market ecosystem puzzle. Real quickly, I'll go to the CBN this morning. Now the CBN has gone back to what they did in February because they need to defend how the currency. So they are selling directly to BDCs, I think at the rate of 1,005, uh, 590 or thereabouts to the dollar. I mean, I can't put a hand on the finger, uh, but they will be making about 20,000 available. To $20,000 available to BDCs by the day. So hopefully this will be able to, you know, stem the decline of Naira. So, but that's an interesting prospect. So it shows that giving to mon the money to the banks didn't work under the Dutch auction system because they were selling as much as 1400 to the banks under the Dutch auction system. They declared at about uh, 900, close to $900 million in that regard, but it never worked. So let's see how this pans out because this was the method they used in February and it did push the Naira uh, back a bit. Uh, secondly, uh, Kamala Harris released her economic plan yesterday. Rotus, between you and I, I am disgusted. The only, the only reason I want Kamala to emerge is because of the madness Trump's bring. But as far as economic prospects <clears throat> under Kamala, I am disgusted. It wasn't a pivot away from, too much away from Biden. It was a lot of not detailed plans. She didn't have a hang on what she wanted to do or what she will do or what she wants to do. She can't explain herself thoroughly. She's just feeling her way in the dark. Let me excite you this morning. How can you say the way to be able to fight inflation of grocery items is to be able to look for a bill as against price gouging? Is that all of it? No talk about supply chains? No talk about improving the supply chain mechanism, just a bill on price gouging, and you don't even have a way, or you've not even explained how you're going to do it? All right, okay. So um, I, I, now it would look like that might just be the chink in the armor and uh, might prove Trump rights that it was honeymoon, the initial grab -gra, like we say in Nigeria, and now getting to the meat of the matter, not able to prove herself or her policies to demonstrate that she is indeed or might be the best candidate for um, U.S. president. And of course, economy is one of the big topic of conversation for the U.S. elections this year. So let's see how that pans out. But let me come back to the Ipman um, spokesperson, Chinedu Ukadika, who had, Ukadike, who had said in an interview yesterday that um, Ipman was now going to, they, they were in conversations with the Dangote refinery to buy PMS directly from, from them, and very importantly, what the impact of that would be, which would then be lower prices, you know, for PMS. He says this because it might have an, an, an you know, it might have an effect on it because it would take away the multiple layers of distribution, which could, you know, hike prices. But beyond that, I think very importantly, what he said was that beyond just depending on um, Dangote refinery, what would really help with prices, as we saw in the telecommunications, um, you know, sector is for more supply. And that's talking about NNPCL and showing that the refineries which they promised would work, would work. And that's so with Portaco refinery coming on stream, it's even more hope for the Nigerian people in terms of PMS. I'm glad that we're seeing some light in this regard and hopefully at the end of the day, the Nigerian people would win. But yes, um, it, um, good move there by Ipman and looking forward to seeing that reflected in the pump price of petrol. Well, very quickly, you were talking about Kenya uh, getting loan from Abu Dhabi. Um, okay, these developing countries, the global south, which uh, Nigeria was talking about in the national statement, and Nigeria calling for debt forgiveness for the global south. 
Kenya, the same Global South, keeps uh, looking for loans from everywhere. Kenya now has gone to Abu Dhabi. The IMF has just approved a seven billion loan uh, to a cash-strapped uh, Pakistan. Last year, 2023, Pakistan took uh, you know three billion loan from this same IMF, and then they've given uh, difficult conditions that IMF cannot meet. But the big narrative is as Nigeria was pointing out in the national statement at the uh, UNGA, 79th UNGA, that, oh, there should always be debt forgiveness. The question to ask, either in Pakistan or Kenya or Nigeria, is what do these, our leaders from the global south, which is the phrase that Nigeria used in that statement, what do they do with these loans? Accountability deficit. So it's not enough to say IMF will bail us out. What do you do with it? Or you go to Abu Dhabi. Uh, President Tinubu in the statement was saying multilateral credit, bilateral loans. No. Africans worry about what their leaders do with their loans. The same way the people of Pakistan worry. The second thing, Caroline Ellison, 29-year-old, the girlfriend of uh, Bankman Freed, who was sentenced to uh, 25 years for stealing over $8 billion of depositors' money, has also this week been sentenced to uh, two years' imprisonment instead of uh, 110 years because she had a plea bargain. She's to return uh, 11 billion. So all this talk about cryptocurrency, people also have to worry about the fraud. Finally, China. The position of economic analysts is that, yeah, China released a slew of measures to check uh, the deflationary pressure in the economy, to reflate the economy. But uh, those measures do not go far enough. Asian stocks went up yesterday and uh, Tuesday, they did well. But what China still needs to do is to reflect the economy, address the uh, slump in the real estate sector, and also work on consumer spending. Would this go far enough? Would China be able to achieve the objective of 5% growth in 2024? These are the questions, in my view. Thank you very much, Rutus.